This is Bill Farmer. Welcome back to McMaster course Computer Science 1JC3 Introduction to Computational Thinking. We are in the middle of the topic recursion. This is a good time to talk a little bit about the difference between recursion and iteration. Iteration is basically using loops. So we can say that a function definition by recursion is declarative. This means our definition just describes what the function is. It doesn't describe how we're going to evaluate it. It's really up to the programming language implementation to evaluate it. So the programmer only worries about defining the function. The programming language implementation worries about evaluating function applications. Uh, for this reason, uh, correctness is easier to show than with iteration because all we have to worry about is the definition. We don't have to worry about how it's going to be evaluated. That is done by the programming language. We're going to assume naturally that the programming language has been implemented correctly. Now, loops can be simulated space efficiently by functions defined by tail recursion. So, even though we don't, we may have a programming language without loops, we can simulate them by functions with tail recursion. A function at the bottom here is tail recursive if all computation is performed before a recursive call. That means we don't make a recursive call, get the value, and then add something to it. We do all our computation, then we make the recursive call the last thing. That's why it's called tail recursive. And we can do away with loops if we have functions that are tail recursive, as long as we implement tail recursion efficiently. So loops are normally executed in constant space. This means that uh, when you're executing a loop, you have some variables, you update them, but you, your memory doesn't grow. And we can, ex we can implement tail recursion to work the same way. Uh, unfortunately, in most programming languages, tail recursion is not implemented properly. So what happens is, if we're trying to simulate a loop using recursion, instead of using constant space, we're going to use more and more space. We have to consume more and more space to do the recursion. And it could be the case that we actually run out of space. This sometimes you get a stack overflow error message. Uh, so this is, this is how we do uh, function definitions by recursion. Function definitions by iteration are procedural. What that means is we have to, we have, the programmer has to describe how we're going to evaluate the function. Not only do they have to describe the function, which they do implicitly, they have to describe how we're going to evaluate it. This means the programmer is actually responsible for how evaluation is performed. That makes it harder to show correctness, because not only do we have to show that the function, what the function is, that it's the right function, but we also have to show that it's evaluated in the right way. And if we're using loops, loops are going to be more space efficient. And as I said, most languages recursion um, that have most programming languages have recursion but they may not implement tail recursion properly which means actually loops are the better alternative in a language where tail recursion is implemented correctly then it doesn't matter if you use loops or tail recursion both are equally space efficient okay so i want to go now to a very important example. This is an example for computing this, this notation right here. This notation, which as you know equals f of m plus f of m plus 1 up to f of n minus 1 plus f of n. This, is, this notation is for iterated summation. 
Sometimes it's called big sigma. I'm calling it big sum. Okay, so what's interesting about this function, it takes an integer m, another integer n, and it takes a function. In many programming languages, they're not, things aren't really set up to take functions as input or return functions as output. Uh, but in Haskell, you can do this. You can actually do it in Python too. Here's going to be the type. Notice that m and n are integers, and f is a function, and this function returns something of a type a, and a can be any type in the type class num. Because we're adding up things, it has to be of some type of numbers that we can add up. So that could be like floats or doubles or ints or integers or so forth. Here's the code. Amazingly compact code. Oops. So we have two cases. When m is greater than n, we return 0. In a sense, what we write here doesn't make any sense when m is greater than n. It's just by convention we return 0. 0 works very nicely because 0 is the additive identity of addition. That's why we choose 0. Otherwise, if m is less or equal to n, we apply big sum to m, n minus 1, and f. So we apply it to this. And then we add f of n here. So in other words, let me use a different color. In other words, how are we doing a divide and conquer? We're saying we can compute this whole sum by computing this and then adding this. And how do we compute this? We use recursion. And so that's the basic idea. I break down this iterated summation into two parts, this first part, and I just add the last term, and the first part I can compute by recursion. And I don't really have to say how it's going to be computed. My programming language will do that for me. Okay, so let me erase all this. Okay, so, so I have a question now. Um, remember I said that you can write down recursive definitions that don't make sense. And in order to show that they make sense, we have to assign to every input a natural number and verify that when we make recursive calls, we're always making recursive calls to an input that has a smaller natural number assigned to it. Now, here we have three inputs. We didn't talk about what you do with more than one input, but it works the same way. With these three inputs, I have to assign a natural number to the, the triple, to this triple. Okay, so this brings us to a natural question. What natural number value should be assigned to the tuple m, n, and f of inputs for big sum? I'm going to stop a moment. And, well, you can stop a moment, turn off your video, see what the answer should be. Well, welcome back. Let's look at these one by one. The first one is M. Suppose, so remember we're assigning m to those three inputs. So what's going to happen when we assign it to those three inputs? Well, in this case, we have m is less than or equal to n, and we're going to assign m to this, and guess what? We're going to assign m to this. Whatever we assign to m, the value won't go down. This does not work. Let me get this back. This does not work. Now, if it's n, this does not work either. But the reason it doesn't work for n, and also doesn't work for m, 
we have to assign to these three inputs a natural number. N can be any integer. It could be negative. This doesn't work. Now if we have m minus n, this is looking better because here m minus n will be bigger than m minus n minus 1. So basically m minus n is a distance between m and n. It's getting smaller each time. But there is a problem. What happens if m is greater than n? If m is um, greater than n, let me wait, let me think about this a moment. Well, if m is, is greater than n, then what I said before wasn't, wasn't quite right. If we have m minus here, n, then it's going to be n minus n plus 1. So actually, what I said before was, with this case, it's actually going to get bigger. We're adding 1. So this is no good. And that leaves this case. And this case is a little bit complicated because when m is less or equal to n, this will be the distance. What I said before was this was, I was thinking before this was n minus m, but it's not. It's m minus n. This is a distance between the two. It's going to get smaller. But we have to add 1 to it to make sure we always have a natural number value. Uh, when m is greater than n, like in this case, we're going to assign 0. So, so this is a little complicated because when n equals n, then that will be, in this case, what, would, what do we assign to it? We assign n minus m, which is n plus 1, which equals 1. So when m is greater than n, we assign 0. When m equals n, we assign 1. Okay, so this works. Um, and this also illustrates the fact that it can be rather complicated, especially if you have a complicated definition, to figure out what natural number to assign to the inputs to be able to show that your definition makes sense. Okay, so now I want to talk about some applications of this function. I've written it up here again. And here, big sum says we can go from m equals 1 to 100. m equals 1 to 100, and we apply it to the identity function. So the, this is the identity function. The function takes x as input and gives back x. And we get the number 5050. Is that correct? Well, this allows me to show a little trick of how we can compute these. Basically, what we want to do is we want to add up. We want to add up the first hundred numbers. And we want to do it fast. We can use big sum or we can do it like this. I'm going to write them down like this. Go down the 50, and then when I get to 50, I'm going to go back upwards, back to 100. What is 1 plus 100? Equals 101. What is 2 plus 90? 101. What's 51? 50 with plus 51? 101. 101. This, if we add these up, we get 50 times 101, which is equal to 50, 50. So yes, we could actually have done this one in our head if we knew this little trick. OK, so this, this seems right. Here we're adding up from minus 10 to 10 the identity element. Well, that should be 0 because the negatives cancel, and for 0, we have 0. If we add up minus 10 to 10, of the uh, squares, we get 770. So this would be like 
like here we have, um, you think of it, minus 10 squared plus minus 9 squared and so forth, plus 0 squared, finally we get 10 squared. That adds up to 770. If we do the big sum of 1 to 4 and we use the factorial function, that's going to be 1 factorial plus 2 factorial plus 3 factorial plus 4 factorial, which equals 33. So you see, this is pretty useful, this big sum thing. We can compute lots of different values. Okay, so I have a question about this. Um, what I'd like to do is define something called big prod. Here it is. Big prod is going to take m, n, and f just like big sum, but instead of computing iterated addition, it's going to compute iterated multiplication. Here it is. I'm going to, I want to compute this. And as you know, this equals f of m times f of m plus 1. of f of n minus 1 times f of n. So it computes that. So the interesting thing is, I have written up here the code that will do this. Right here it is. This is the code. The only problem is I didn't tell you what a and b are. The question is, what should a and b be? I'm going to leave that up to you, give you a moment to stop your video, think about it, come up with your answer. Okay, welcome back. We have to figure out what A and B is. B is obvious. If it's working like this, B must be times. That is obvious. A is less obvious. So, so, that, so it's either going to be D or B. And remember I said, by convention, if we go back up, up here, by convention when m is greater than n, we equal 0. But it's, it's convention for a good reason. This is the, additive, this is the um, identity element for addition. So you might think we should have the identity element for multiplication, and that's 1. So this is the right answer. Okay, so what are some applications of big prod? Um, so here's big prod. If I want to multiply 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, I can say that 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, and I use the function identity element, that's 24. And notice that this equals, this is the same thing, as factorial of 4. Now here I could add the first n squares. So this is 1 square plus 2 square. I don't know how I got this thing. Let's just move it out of here. Anyway, where was I? Sorry about that. 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, plus 4 squared. But I made a mistake, right? This is not plus. This is, this is not plus. It is times. And finally, we could add up, multiply the factorials together. 1 factorial times 2 factorial times 3 factorial times 4 factorial. Okay. Okay, let's move on to another interesting example, which is called linear search. So linear search is we have a list of things. I'll write it up here. We have a list of things L. And there's a, a value x. We want to look in that list and see if we can find x. 
Now, we may not actually be looking exactly for x, but we may be looking for something in L that's related to x, and that's where p comes in. So we're going to check to see if there is a y where p relates x to y. So if we were actually looking for x, if we were looking for x instead of p, we would use equality. So this is more general just than just looking for x and l. We're actually looking for a y and l that is related to x by p. Okay, so um, here's going to be my type of my function linear search. It's going to take my list here. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to take x, the thing I'm looking for, or the thing I'm going to compare to things I'm looking for, a list of a, and then it's going to take my predicate p. And notice that the type of the things that we have, we're, we're putting in our list, can be any type. And then I'm going to return a list. Now you may say, well, why, why would you return a list? We want to return y. Y may not be a list. Well, you're going to see in a moment why we do this. And I'm going to define this using both a guarded function definition and pattern match. So the first case is we have linear search where I don't care what x is. I don't care what p is. What I care about is that we have the empty list. If there's nothing in the empty list, we can't possibly find what we're looking for because there's nothing there. So I'm going to return the empty list. And that's a signal that there was nothing there to find. Uh, and notice, notice that uh, this is why I'm returning the list. Because I, you know, I could just return their element, said, you know, or their element would basically say not found. I'm going to say not found by returning an empty list. So the other case. The other pattern is we have a list that actually has a head. It's not empty. And here I take x, I use p, my predicate, I compare x to y. I Maybe compare is not, not as general. I should say we check to see if p is related to y by this predicate. And if it is, I return the list y. Basically, I found the y I'm looking for. If it's not, I apply linear search. I keep x and keep p, but now I apply it to just the tail. So I've, I'm no longer interested in y. We know y isn't the thing we're looking for. And we keep doing this over and over again until eventually this becomes the empty list, and then we're done because then we'll just return the empty list. So, the, so there's two answers that we can get. We get the empty list. We couldn't find a y. And, or we get a list of the first y that we find. OK, so that's one example. Here's another example. This is an example where we want to find the maximum value in a list. Maximum value in a list. So we just have a list. It takes a maximum value. And so we have a list of something, we get the maximum value in that. Now, the type of A has to be in two different type classes because, because we're talking about maximums. It has to, it's going to be numbers. And we have to be able um, to have these things be ordered. So it's, it has to be numbers that are ordered. Uh, not all numbers are ordered. For instance, complex numbers are not really ordered. Or not, not ordered linearly. Let me put it that way. Okay, so the problem here is that um, as I'm moving through the list, I need to keep track of the biggest thing I've found so far. And how do I do that? Well, we're going to do a little trick. And this is done quite often when you define something by recursion. I'm going to define this using an auxiliary function. And this 
this means auxiliary. It's a function that goes with it. And this function, max and list, is not defined recursively. My auxiliary function is. And my auxiliary function, it's going to take the tail of x, and it's going to take the head. So basically what it's going to do is, I'm trying to find the maximum in this list. I'm going to assume that the maximum is the head. The second value will hold the biggest thing I found so far, and then I will apply it to the tail. And so the auxiliary function has a similar type to here. Here's how it works. Uh, if my list is empty, I return M. That will be the biggest thing I found so far. Um, if my um, if if the head if the head of X is less than or equal to M, then I apply max and list auxiliary to the tail of x and m. I use the same m as I had before because the head is smaller. If the head turns out to be strictly bigger, I apply max and list auxiliary to tail of x and this new head because this new head is bigger than the current one. And I continue that way. Now notice, you may, you may notice there's a problem here. Could be a problem. What is max and list of the empty list? Well, notice I notice, let me clean this up a bit. Notice up here where I have the definition, I never defined it. Why did I not define it? Because it's really not, there's nothing I can say about it unless I unless we have things that we haven't talked about yet, exceptions, we have to bring up an exception, something went wrong, we need a signal that something went wrong. Because if you have an empty list, there is no maximum in the empty list. Mathematically, it should be undefined. Okay, well, we're going to finish up by talking about another famous American mathematician, logician, and computer scientist. This is Stephen Claney. He was a student of church at Princeton. Uh, you probably are beginning to think that things were happening at Princeton uh, for a long time. Princeton is sort of the good again. Princeton is sort of the good again of the United States. It has traditionally been the most important research center for mathematics in the U.S. That's, that's not entirely true, but it has generally been true for quite a long time. Anyway, Stephen Cleaney is one of the founders of the subfield of logic known as computability theory or recursion theory. This is really the theory of what computation is. So he's a name every computer scientist should know about. He's also the inventor of regular expressions, the Cleaney star operation, which you apply to a set like this. That would be, this was a set of, of um, symbols. Clean, let me write it a little clearer. If A is a set of symbols, let's say an alphabet, uh, A star would be the set of all strings or the alphabet. He's also important because there's Cleaney algebra named after him. He made significant contribution to a kind of logic called constructive logic, where with constructive logic, instead of proving that something exists, the only way you can prove that something exists is you have to actually exhibit an example. And he, entered, he wrote a book called The Introduction to Math Metamathematics, which is a highly influential textbook published in 1952. So he's a very important um, mathematician, logician, and computer scientist. He's interesting in my life. Let me explain why he's interesting. I guess I don't really have to clean this up, but I'm going to. Um, he's interested, interesting in my life because, remember, he is a student of church. What I said before... Alonzo Church 
is important for many reasons, but one reason is he had a lot of very important students. I told you about Turing and about Scott. There's many famous. Rabin. Um, Rosser. These are very famous logicians. And, and we have Clean, Claney here. And I also mentioned that I'm in this tree because my advisor is here. The farmer is here. So I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I went there to study lo mainly logic in the math department. I went there because there was a very strong group in logic. Stephen Cleaney was a person who started that group, and he was still there. He was retired, but he was still there at the University of Wisconsin when I was a graduate student. And I can say that when I was a graduate student, I was a member of a little club, you could say. It was a club to look at the philosophy of mathematics. And the members of this club were all math graduate students, or they were philosophy graduate students. And we used to give talks to each other, and I gave a talk once. I gave it on different sort of bogus ways to express um, bogus ways to express statements that say a logic is consistent. And so I gave this little talk, and only graduate students would show up. But when I gave my talk, Cleaning showed up. And he, you know, when we were at the University of Wisconsin as graduate students, I mean, he was revered. He's the person who started the program. He's one of the greatest logicians of all time. He shows up to my talk, and I'm talking about a subject he is an absolute expert on. And guess what he did? He fell asleep after five minutes. Uh, I learned that at his age, he was probably in his 70s, and he usually fell asleep at most talks. He slept the, through the whole talk, and just when I was done, he woke up, and he raised his hand. I called upon him, and he said he had some comments to make. He said he didn't hear everything I had to say. Of course he didn't hear. He was asleep. He made some comments, and these comments were all about the subject matter of my talk. It's almost as if he heard the talk. Anyway, that was an interesting but scary moment in my academic life. So we're going to stop now, and this ends this topic. Uh, see you next time.